been through the makeup show in the past, and you're saying that this is the biggest show that we've had in Orlando. What is setting this show apart to make it the biggest? I think with this year, one of the things that I always try and do is to, is to keep the show a boutique show. What do I mean by that? I mean that I want to introduce new brands, but also keep it in a way that is very manageable and that it still makes impact. I want to curate so that there are brands that might have similar products, but offer different viewpoints, different price points, um, different belief systems. And that can get difficult sometimes because while I want to introduce something new, I never want to sacrifice quality and I never want to inundate with too many of one product. Uh, brushes, for example. I have a handful of brush lines that offer quality brushes at easy prices, mid-range and luxury prices. And that will allow artists at every stage of their career to kind of have the best available to them. Um, this year we've introduced a few new vendors, and we introduced a few vendors that are multi-branded. Brands like Alcone that carry kind of the cult products that every makeup artist would have, nor Costco, Friends, Nigel's, allowing me to bring in a taste of a few brands. So I have Jouer, AJ Crimson, and Gorgeous here with Friends um, as a way to kind of introduce a selection of products. Alcone is bringing in Cinema Secrets and Dante Disposables and Zhao and uh, a little bit of everything. And we're also growing with our attendees. We have more attendees through the door this year than we've ever had before. I met with over 3,000 students in the weeks leading up to the show to kind of get the new blood in and let them know that there are mentors available to them and to let them know the possibilities available. And we have more education than ever, ever. The inclusion of our focus series, I think, has taken things to a new level. Um, I think sometimes people got on the floor and there were so many choices, people were getting overwhelmed. And what I wanted to do was create an area where makeup artists could get a chance to play with product, to compare and contrast like with like, and take notes on it and try it and feel it and touch it and then make informed decisions so they could take a found liquid foundation from seven or ten different brands and see what the differences are in actuality before making a decision on what to purchase. I thought this was also great for the brands because for the brands that don't have the million dollar advertising budget, it's a great way to be able to put it all kind of on the same level. So that's kind of the way that we've really grown the show this year. What are you hoping to see come out next? I think we've seen so much, so much technology lately and so many brands kind of looking at waterproofing, um, cream shadows and aqua products from Makeup Forever, Bobbi Brown, Smashbox, Jouer, um, aqua liners and waterproof liners from Smashbox and NARS and Makeup Forever. And I think that while I appreciate waterproof and the way that it holds up, um, I think for me, the boldness of pigment is what I really look for. Um, the reason I love brands like Makeup Forever, OCC, or my brand Artemisian is because we really look at pigment that works in every possible situation. From the lightest to the darkest skin, you should have impact of pigment, and you don't always see that with product. And I think those days should be over. Any makeup wearer, regardless of their skin tone, should be able to find a foundation that works for them, find a color that works for them, um, and, and be able to know that when they buy something at the store, the color will translate the same way on their skin. And I think we haven't seen that, um, and I think we're seeing strides towards that. The Arden Sien Manuka Honey Press Pigments work really well with what you see is what you get. Yeah, um, Arden Sien, that's one of our goals, is that when you pick up one of our pencils or Manuka Honey Pigments or lip glosses, whether you're on the lightest side of the spectrum or the darkest or deepest side, our product is going to be a true color. And that comes down to pigment load. And I think there are so many brands available at the makeup show um, that also do that. And I really tried to do that. Central Florida is a diverse market. And not everyone has always felt included in what makeup is available here. And so we really try and look at regardless of your skin tone or your lifestyle, there's something here for you. What foundation line do you feel has the best range from the lightest to dark? I know that's probably tough, but I mean, you work on so many different people, so many different skin tones. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think there are a number of brands here with us that have those ranges. Cinema Secrets was one of the first. Maurice Stein, with the development of Cinema Secrets, was really the first person to develop a line that was multi-ethnic. Um, he had 38 foundation shades, 50 foundation shades, in his first few collections, and that was unheard of at the time in 1980 when he started. I think the artistry brands like Makeup Forever are very well known for their range of products and they are introducing 10 new golden shades for the U.S. market. Um, I think Tem2 does a great job of ranges, Obsessive Compulsive does a great job of light to dark but also has a, um, a great golden tone to it and, and is vegan and cruelty free. I think brands are addressing it. I think even a brand like Inglot, which traditionally hadn't dealt with darker skin tones, is in the process of developing those darker skin tones. But I think for the makeup artist, you don't, you just can't assume that everyone is going to have what you need. You need to be able to find those shades, a light, a medium, and a dark yellow, a light, a medium, and a dark red tone, and mix and match them until they work for you. But I would say if someone needed a deeper, darker foundation, I would probably say Cinema Secrets um, is probably where I would look at this show, or AJ Crimson. Uh, and while AJ Crimson tends to be a line for women of color, um, you can really work with his lighter foundation. And he had a foundation match for me, so yeah. I was... He really kind of runs the gamut from light to dark. Speaking, you spoke on diversity, and one thing that I noticed about the makeup show is that it's a very diverse group of brands and people behind the brands from different races, gender, um, what inspired you to make it so diverse? I don't know any other way. Um, I come from a diverse family and diverse ethnic background. I got into the beauty industry because I was writing my thesis on women of color and the white beauty myth, and that's kind of what brought me to makeup, trying to understand why everyone was not represented in beauty. You know, how can we define or decide that only 10 skin tones are the beauty ideal? Why do we manufacture misbelief that only below a size 10 is a beauty ideal? And I think that I've always approached beauty with the kind of mindset of an outsider. Um, and I think that the makeup show is kind of that combination. What I love about this industry is there is no limit. In makeup, it doesn't matter what you look like if you're the one who is the most talented. If you're fat or thin, gay or straight, black or white, rich or poor, speak English, Spanish or Vietnamese, you know, there is that place for you here if you have the talent. And I think that our makeup show team is very diverse. So we really have always tried to build the show in that way. This is an industry of outsiders. This is an industry that ranges from the kids that sat by themselves in the cafeteria to the most popular person in high school. It's an industry of single mothers and, you know, transgendered parents. It's an industry of Christian conservatives and kooky outsiders. And we kind of embrace it all and try and create a community that is accept not only accepting, but allowing every person to kind of find their own aesthetic and their own art. Kind of, that too soapboxy. No, it was really yeah. good. Um, how do you feel like the current state of diversity in the industry is? Do you feel like there's been progress? Do you feel like we're going into a progressive direction? You know, this is a tough question for me this week. I'm really kind of struggling with it because I think while we are seeing brands that embrace women of color, I think that a lot of times it still comes down to the advertising dollar. And I find that to be a bit distressing. I had a conversation in New York this week with a black model who uh, was working in the 90s. And it's still crazy to me that in 2014, we're still having a talk on why there are only three black faces on magazine covers right now, or none at all. Um, why do we choose one black actress and decide she's the black actress of the moment? We don't do that with white actresses. Why are we so excited that there are Asian people on TV now? You know, like, oh, there's an Asian in a commercial and everybody notices it because it's not the norm. And I think that we have got to be able to push beyond that. So I think that there are strides being made. Our first lady and our president should have broken barriers and should have allowed all of these 
kind of things to happen, but I think the racism that we see in politics is, you know, it is, it's, it's a way of, uh, that people are seeing the world and the beauty industry is no dim different. We live in a heteronormative makeup industry. We live in a Caucasian centric beauty industry. We live in an industry that although most of the clients are women and most of the artists are women, it's still the men that get celebrated and talked about and touted as the best in the business. So while I do think we're making strides, um, I don't think we're perfect. I do love that when we talk about the biggest names in the business right now, it tends to be women. And what I try to do with this show is bring in some of the women. People like Eugenia Weston, who's the godmother of eyebrow gurus. People like Erin Kruger McCash, who's a 22 time Emmy nominee. You know, people like the panelists of Face Off, where out of the panel, Laura is the winner uh, of the show. And I think that that's kind of how we try and approach it. We try and show all sides. So uh, I do think it's getting better. I hope, I hope, I, you know. Um, but who knows? Kim Kardashian is being kind of you know, vilified this week for showing her butt on a cover of a magazine. Are we surprised that she clamors for attention? Her whole career has been about getting more attention for herself. Is the fact that she's naked, you know, makes her nasty or we use terrible terms to talk about her? We think because she's a mother now she has to be sexless or because she's married to a man that she somehow belongs to him. I think that it creates a bigger dialogue um, than just the beauty industry, but I do think the beauty industry is trying to move forward. It just requires everybody to kind of move forward in a way that is maybe more open-minded. I'm sorry, I'm You're like, fine. You and, started and, because... No, when um, Brittany and I were talking about how many brands at Sephora still don't cater to women of color, and when you tweet at them or you try to interact with them, they're like, well, they don't buy product, and it's like, well, you don't make product they can buy. So it's like this catch-22. It is a catch-22, and it's very difficult, and I have been on both sides of the coin, being at MAC at the beginning, being at Urban Decay at the beginning, and Stila at the beginning. I think that what a lot of consumers don't realize is that in order to create one foundation shade, you're creating 10,000 of a foundation. And so if you're creating a shade for a darker, or deeper skin that doesn't embrace your brand, um, it makes it very difficult to move forward with that. And I think that traditionally brands have decided I'm focusing on one area of the marketplace, whether that was African-American or Caucasian or Latina skins. Um, well, you hit, you pointed it out earlier. One of the things that I found very disappointing in some of the brands that I love is that you used to see more diversity now and you see less. Um, with Urban Decay, who's one of my favorite brands, they used to have different models of color and now you just see a white girl. Not that, you know, just, <laughs> it's like, why are you going backwards? I know. I think that the, the dialogues have changed with some of the brands. Urban Decay just went through a buyout that's going to influence not only their product formulations, but their presence in the marketplace. And I think that for many of the young makeup brands, when you look uh, at women of color as a possible market, there are brands like MAC or Makeup Forever that tend to own that already. Uh, we have here at the show this weekend, Morel Hollis, who is the creative director of Black Opal. We have Tia Dantzler, who is the creative director of Fashion Fair. These are lines that have traditionally been about African-American women or women from the island, and no one has ever had an issue with that fact. And I think that what, we try, what we've tried to do as pros is show that every brand should be for every woman. And I think that brand, places like Sephora kind of put a spotlight on the fact that net every brand works that way because you can compare uh, in a way that you never were able to in the department store. But I think that I understand the expense of developing for all women, even with Art and CN. We have shades that when we came to market, we knew we were introducing a lighter shade and two darker shades. But even in development of a darker shade, it required more lab time because darker skins aren't just darker, they're deeper. And to have the level of pigment that we do, it required perfection. Because when you come to market with a foundation that doesn't work for darker skin, they're never coming back to it. So I understand why brands are cautious, but I don't think it excuses the fact that brands are not catering to women of all races.
Not a good answer. That's a good Not answer. Really good answer. If you were going to be recommending a brand for a new artist to work out with, what would you recommend? Like, what would you say this this will give you the good range you were mentioning? With oh God, that's a tough question. Um, a brand for a brand for an artist who's just starting out to start with. You know, for me, that's a difficult question because I don't have just one. Well, okay. Well, you know, two or three. I I wasn't I would sure. say Stila is a very easy brand. Okay. You know, I think they get overlooked a lot by pros um, because they don't have the path of pigment or the punch of some of the other brands. But Stila is a brand that has always embraced everyone. Uh, it tends to be about softer lines and structures, so it's very easy for the consumer or the pro to manipulate. I think that uh, they've got a great division for the pro, Kanisha, who has just come on with them, really understands the needs of the pro and how to take some of those kind of Stila Hero products like a convertible color or uh, an eyeliner and really make them work. I think NARS is another brand that uh, has always been very easy to understand. And they embrace a lot of color. They do embrace color, they embrace texture. They've had women of all colors represent the brand from the very beginning. I think that the price point can sometimes be a little prohibitive and their brand culture doesn't feel as inclusive. It can be a little intimidating. For artists, I think Inglot, uh, if you ignore their foundation range, is a brand that really works well for everyone. We launched Inglot in the U.S. and we really saw communities kind of love the product because the pigment pack is there with so much. Makeup Forever has always been a brand about diversity. Um, and I think they've become more consumer friendly with products like HD that really allow a beginner stage artist or early stage makeup wearer to kind of play without feeling like, Ooh, it's so much color. And uh, I think Senna, I'm kind of in love with Senna right now. It just is a very beautiful brand. Uh, if you're just starting out products like their brow book and their blush palette. Um, what do you think about their foundation? I like their foundation. I don't know it as well as some of the others on the market. Uh, the finish is probably not the finish that I use so often, but I think that their brow products, their blush products, their lip products are, are good supplements in my kit. I tend to be very minimal with what I carry for foundation. I don't need very much. I can take a cream palette from a an RCMA or a Mayron or a Graftobian or Kevin Aquan or Makeup Forever and make that everything that I need it to be. So I really kind of look to other ingredients, you know, what other product can I put on the face to really bring something forward. And I, I find that Senna is a really great brand for that. So what would you recommend to women who just want like a five minute face, very minimal products? Uh, a three product face is always my goal. That's my directive with Ardencian. It's a five minute face. It's uh, finding an impact point, you know. I think a uh, foundation, a bronzer and a lip gloss or a mascara, a brow pencil and a lipstick are things that you can put on in two to five minutes that can completely transform a face. I don't think, I don't approach makeup in, in the mindset that it's about covering or hiding. I think for me makeup is more about expressing and, and celebrating. So for me to polish a brow, to throw on a lash and to put a gloss in the center of a lip or to take a lipstick and put it on the lip and cheek and eye, something like a, a multiple from NARS or a convertible color is a beautiful way to bring color to any application.